you will hear me uh, clearly right yeah 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 we can hear you so uh, okay we should start chapter 10 uh, the participants are joining just now or we may wait a uh, few minutes to a few minutes Can I just uh, check if uh, the sharing is? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly. please. Are you now, or uh, can you uh, see my PPT? Yeah. It is visible. It's visible, right? Uh, please go to uh, yeah. So uh, the presentation mode, it is visible. Right? Yeah. In the okay. Yes, sir. Are we waiting for more panelists, panel members, sir? I think uh, we are waiting for Dr. Aran Dutto. If he he will be joining, be because he is the another speaker of today's second session. So just uh, Dr. Bag as says, maybe we wait just a couple of minutes and then we start. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, I think he may not join. Uh, this session, but uh, yeah. okay. I think then uh, what's the exact time now? From my here is uh, it's showing ten past two. So I think we should start ten past two. Okay then. Okay. So so should we begin then? Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just we take the panelists, the panelists, one should be chocolate work production, one should be charia. Sir, uh, shall we close the sir uh, display now? Yeah, yeah, you can close the display, and then uh, when Dr. Bag will be invited, then he will share the screen. Then, yeah. Yes. So okay, uh, let's start. So we are at the day two of five-day online faculty development program on computational techniques in 
um, chemistry and material science and uh, how to use the contemporary software tools. And on behalf of the organizing committee of this FDP, a very good morning and warm welcome to all the esteemed panelists and definitely the participants uh, at day two of the five day FDP. So I'm very thankful that all the attendees who registered for this FDP and uh, for their precious time to join the first session of day two. And uh, just uh, before we begin the session, let me uh, have the opportunity to introduce briefly the today's panel members uh, in this session. So far, we have with us um, Dr. Orijit Bhak and uh, Dr. Anirban Roy from Macau, West Bengal. Um, and uh, we have uh, Dr. Manojit Bhak from uh, IIT Ruki. We have uh, Dr. Can you hear me now? It's OK. Yeah, we have uh, Dr. Shudip Chakraborty from uh, IIT Indore. We have Shumantra Bhattacharya from IIT Sik uh, sorry, NIT Sikkim. Uh, we have heard uh, the hands-on session yesterday. He has delivered. Excellent session was that. So with that uh, brief introduction of the panelists, may I now request uh, Dr. Orijit Bhag to kindly introduce uh, Dr. Manojit Bhag uh, from IIT Roorkee. Dr. Bhag, please. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh, for... Uh... Uh, giving me the opportunity to introduce our uh, speaker today, Dr. Monjit Bhak, who is presently uh, the Assistant Professor of uh, Physics Department of IIT, Roorkee. Uh, he actually uh, did his graduation from uh, University Jadavpur University with electrical engineering, that is called B background. And then he moved to uh, University of Pune for his uh, master degree in physics. So that is jump from engineering to uh, a general academic line, uh, team, and uh, he uh, passed with uh, the first uh, position of this university and secured the gold medal for that. Also, he is uh, awarded the late uh, Sotis Bhide Prize for the best project in MSc. He passed his MSc in 2006, and then he moved to JNCSR for his uh, postdoctoral work, and. Uh, after completing his postdoctoral work on 2011, he uh, stayed there for a period of one year nearly for uh, research associate. And then he moved to USA for his postdoctoral uh, experience. And he stayed uh, there about three years there with very uh, uh, high quality of research. In his uh, PhD work, he has uh, discovered uh, the uh, polymer-based artificial retina, which is uh, then uh, sold to uh, um, that uh, company uh, for uh, marketization. And during his postdoctoral work, he has developed a new methodology for water-based fabrication method for field film coating for uh, device management. And uh, coming back from USA, he uh, moved uh, to Sweden for a very short period uh, to the Lund University, which is a famous university. Uh, he, uh, for that uh, position, he has uh, got the Oynar Green Postdoctoral Fellowship. And in 2016, January, he joined IIT Roorkee as a professor, assistant professor there. So uh, his research work mainly on uh, different solar cell uh, present he is working on uh, perovskite solar cell. So with that brief interview, I am uh, requesting Dr. Bhag to deliver his talk. Please, Dr. Bhag. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, should I start screen uh, sharing my screen now? Yes. Yeah. So is it visible, right? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ghosh and Dr. Uh, Dr. Bhag for. Uh, Please uh, reshare it, sir. It is not visible, sir. Okay. Uh, so let me just try it again. Oh, now it is coming. Yeah, it is coming. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. Uh, so, thank you, Dr. Ghosh and uh, Dr. Bhag. And uh, thank you, the organizing team, for inviting me to uh, deliver a talk. So, the, today, uh, the title of my talk is Polymer Nano Nanoparticle Solar Cell. So, I'll briefly touch upon the experimental part which I cover 
and maybe a little bit of uh, theory to understand nanoparticle assemblies. At the same time, I'll also try to touch upon some of the theoretical aspects of uh, uh, polymer part as well. So uh, before going into my uh, presentation, I just uh, would like to introduce my institute. Uh, currently, I am as assistant professor. So this is the uh, administrative building of IIT Roorkee. Uh, maybe I should use the uh, laser pointer. It will be better now. So that's the uh, administrative building. It's a very nice uh, view. There are some uh, nice uh, residential areas for the students. Uh, this is the uh, central library called uh, Mahatma Gandhi Central Library. Uh, there is convocation center, which, uh, which is more than like 4,000 uh, uh, occupancy it can, it can have. And then we have all these, uh, the, uh, the academic buildings here. So in short, you can say like there are 22 departments, uh, mostly engineering. Apart from that, there are three science departments like mathematics, chemistry, and physics. These are the basic uh, science department. And we have uh, three center of excellence, center of disaster management, center of excellence, and uh, uh, center of nanotechnology. So I'm, uh, I'm also part of the center of nanotechnology I'm associated with. Other than that, there are eight service centers, including uh, the computer centers, including the uh, institute instrumentation center and so on. There are more than 450 faculties, currently even more now. So if you look at the undergraduate student, mostly the BTEC, uh, BTEC students, there are uh, more than 4,000. There are 1,800 PG students and around 1,600 plus uh, PhD students. So that is in brief. The IIT Roorkee, it is situated in uh, Paridwar near Ganga Canal. So the talk actually co will cover uh, some part of it. Like you can see, uh, I'll introduce the energy demand in the world because that is what we are working on. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, briefly talk about the polymer solar cell, how the <coughs> sorry polymer solar cells are made, uh, like conventional solar cell architecture and their drawbacks. Definitely, that's what comes the nanoparticle approach. Then I'll introduce one technique which will be uh, very useful to understand uh, the interface of uh, all these optoelectronic devices, like starting from solar cells to LEDs and all other uh, bilayer or maybe multilayer structures. Then at the end, I'll talk about the binary nanoparticle approach, which is very useful for not only for solar cell, but some other uh, materials which needs very precise control of uh, charge transport, or maybe like you can have charge and ion transports. And then finally, I'll uh, conclude my talk. So if you look at the energy demand, uh, so this is a projection all, all over the world. And you can see like this, like more than seven uh, 7,000 terawatt hour. Now that is uh, predicted in 2013. And uh, majority of them are like heating and cooling. Then there are some lighting sectors, kitchen appliances and inter entertainment. So definitely uh, this is increasing. Like if you look at the 2005 to 2000, uh, right now we are at tw uh, 2020, this is almost like uh, crossing uh, three, uh, 350 terawatt hour. Uh, per year. So that's a huge amount of energy and it is projected that it will be even double by 2030. Now, if you look at the uh, US energy uh, scenario, the majority comes from uh, coal, right? The 40% and now it is decreasing though. I mean, like the trend is there that uh, the, uh, the conventional energy source such as coal and natural gas that is basically depleting and you can see the projected one. So uh, gradually decreasing uh, coal and natural gas. At the same time, probably uh, renewable energy source such as like hydropower and uh, non-hydropower renewable sources. Nuclear is always there. Uh, this is a major part of uh, nuclear energy is also there, but there are some other challenges for nuclear energy. And that is uh, not uh, the uh, very, uh, what do you call this, uh, clean in that sense. So it has a lot of uh, uh, environmental hazard effect. Now, if you look at the uh, India, India's uh, uh, electricity uh, demand and supply, it is definitely uh, increasing day by day. And in India, actually, more than 40 to 50 percent is coal, and maybe another 30 percent from oil. So that's like almost 70 to 75 percent 
coming from coal and oil. And we have very small amount of like bioenergy, natural gas, and maybe like nuclear and other renewable energies, small fraction you can see here. So the projected uh, by 2030 or 2040, you can see, we still relying on uh, the uh, natural sources like coal and oil. That's, that's not uh, good for the environment as well as uh, for the sustainability, right? So why we are not so uh, confident about the uh, natural gas or uh, coal? So if you look at the energy conversion, we cannot directly use like coal or natural uh, gas or maybe like a petroleum oil. So we need to convert it to some useful energy. So if you look at this, all these uh, natural resources, either they are used for the electricity generation, but again, you can see only 38% has been converted to the uh, electricity. And uh, petroleum and other, you can see like around 27%. Uh, and if you look at the waste, waste is more than like what we use. Like we use around say 30% uh, and we use, uh, I mean like waste is almost like 50%, uh, right? So that, that is not a good sign of like using energy. I mean, we are not using energy very efficient ways. So that's what also US is also like going towards more like re renewable energy source such as a solar cell. So if you look at the uh, projected forecast here, uh, this part is like wind, wind uh, that is the majority. Then you have the solar, you have some biofuel, then geothermal, and then some other waste. So they are uh, going towards the uh, solar energy, which will, uh, which will be very useful. And same as like India also, like uh, this is a 2019 report. You can see almost like uh, 25 uh, gigawatt power has been installed in India and it has been projected that uh, 100 gigawatt power will be in installed by 2020, which will uh, supersede basically uh, the uh, wind energy generation. Now, why we are banging on solar energy, right? I mean, like, I mean, like, if we look at the energy availability from like uh, sunlight, although like it is uh, like almost like uh, 12 hours per day, majority of this solar spectrum are the visible spectrum, right? And then you have almost like 50% uh, is like infrared to uh, microwave. So uh, definitely, there are some materials which can go up to like uh, 1.1. Uh, micron, that is like the silicon, if I use some sort of silicon materials, which can still have just around like 1.1 micron, but the visible is mostly this, and most of the solar cells are work in this regime. We can have some multi-junction and some other solar cells which can extend till uh, infrared will uh, come to that point in a meter. So the bottom line is the solar has a huge amount of energy uh, coming on the earth surface, almost like 1.37 kilowatt per meter square, right? So if you, if you uh, extrapolate it, and uh, if, I, if I look at the energy demand, and if I, if I assume like 10% to 15% uh, energy conversion, you need just few fraction of land, which will be uh, sufficient enough to supply all this energy demand. So that's what everybody is banging on uh, solar energy nowadays. So a little bit of uh, solar spectrum, because uh, we know like it's a, it's a black body radiation when it comes out of the uh, sun surface, but when it reaches the uh, earth surface, there are a lot of uh, absorption due to like oxygen, water molecule, or maybe carbon dioxide, there are a lot of uh, dips you can see. These are, these are absorbed uh, photon by uh, water, oxygen, or um, uh, carbon dioxide. So that's what the the uh, energy reaching on the earth surface is somewhat lesser than the uh, the energy coming out of the uh, sun surface, but still good enough to generate a lot of power from solar energy. Right. So now, if you look at the energy chart, uh, like it is, it, it gets updated uh, uh, by NREL, National Renewable Energy uh, Laboratory in USA. Uh, like whenever there is a new uh, solar cell, which has uh, the highest efficiency. So in a real, basically certified uh, those uh, solar cells. So here you can see uh, there are like uh, first generation solar cell, mostly the crystalline solar cell. And there are some uh, multi-junction solar cell. It could be like 
uh, triple junction, four junction, but these are very expensive and normally used in satellites. Uh, this is commercialized like uh, crystalline silicon, uh, maybe single crystalline, bit expensive, but polycrystalline can be definitely useful for domestic purpose. So these are all uh, crystalline silicon solar cell. Then comes the second generation solar cell. These are all uh, thin pin based like uh, CIGS, uh, cadmium telluride, and uh, uh, some other uh, uh, thin film solar cell. And now these are the uh, emerging photovoltaic technologies, which is nowadays growing because of a lot of advantages. So we'll come to that point, such as like Dyson solar cell, perovskite solar cell, perovskite silicon tandem. I mean, it has reached more than 25% now, or maybe 27% now. Perovskite itself has reached 25%. Organic solar cells, various type of organic solar cells. It could be polymeric, it could be small molecule uh, solar cells. There are some uh, uh, quantum dot, bit, uh, dot based solar cell as well. So if you look at all this energy chart, uh, that is what the uh, growth for this emerging photovoltaic technologies. Maybe somewhere like uh, early 2000 it starts and now it is uh, growing quite uh, efficiently. So. Uh, this is what the uh, the organic solar cell is. It has reached up to like 16% and uh, Tandem has reached even uh, beyond that. So that is what the organic uh, solar cell is. Now, if you look at the solar cell market, it is also increasing. And you can see uh, majority coming from say, uh, you can see like Europe, North America, Central and South America. Then you have the China, South Asia, that is very small part. Like if you consider like India uh, having uh, so much of uh, solar energy and this is the rest of the world. So if you compare, we, we don't have any single entity as such. So we are lacking the generation of solar energy in that sense. But if you look at the market, it is quite huge. So, uh, so it is projected that 8.9% of the global energy which will be generated uh, uh, by solar. Uh, and that can go up to like uh, 2000, uh, uh, like 600 terawatt hour electricity, right? Now, why we are lacking? I mean, <coughs> what is the bottleneck? Now it is like, if you look at the uh, price, right? So conventional energy, we get much uh, at a much cheaper price. So that is what the, if you can see like utility bulk power, that is somewhere here. Utility peak power, that is somewhere here. But look at the photovoltaics. So early 90s, it was so expensive. So people uh, could not think about like using solar energy for the domestic applica applications, right? Now, as the technology uh, grows and the uh, manufacturing cost goes down, the cost for uh, watt, kilowatt hour, that also uh, uh, gradually uh, going down, you can see like projected by 2030 or 2040, it will match the conventional energy source. Not only that, definitely the, uh, the uh, environmental aspect is also there because it's a green and clean energy compared to like uh, natural gas, uh, like burning coal, coal or natural gas, right? So that is another aspect of it. So you can see that is what called like grid parity. So if the solar energy is comparable to the uh, grid energy, definitely people will be uh, using the solar energy quite efficiently and uh, uh, when the uh, production cost will also go down as the uh, demand increases. So that is what the uh, solar energy is. Now, why we are not relying, just not relying on silicon solar cell? Definitely silicon has a long lasting, uh, um, it's a very uh, long stability, right? You can see like whenever you install a solar panel, it, it can last more than 20, 25 years. Right, but the challenge is it is very heavy. So, uh, like you might have seen, like solar panel, uh, it needs a lot of encapsulations and support, and uh, itself uh, silicon itself needs like a few few hundreds of micron thick silicon to absorb light. So, normally silicon solar cells are much heavier, and uh, definitely because of the thick uh, uh, structure they are not very flexible. So you cannot use on a curved surface and require a lot of infrastructure to uh, grow either uh, single crystals or polycrystalline silicon from silica, 
So silica melting point is very, very high, 1400, 14 degrees centigrade. So that's quite high. So you need a lot of energy to extract silica from silica, uh, silicon from silica, uh, silica, right? And most of the wafer we are still uh, importing either from China or some other countries. We are not able to manufacture uh, silicon solar cell in India. So that is what one of the challenge. Like if I think about like um, India should be self-sustained or self-sustainable uh, countries, we need alternate method where we can fabricate solar cell in our own countries. So that is where comes the polymer nanoparticle, uh, polymer solar cell. I'll come to the nanoparticle later on. So if you look at the polymer solar cell, they are much more thinner, much more lighter. You can see they are very flexible. You can roll it like this. So, and they are also semi-transparent, right? You, you can use in uh, many various ways. So you'll see uh, that in a minute. So they're also semi-transparent, right? And they are compatible on rolled roll printing. So you can fabricate solar cell on a, like, like a printing a paper, right? So you have a, a big roll and you can put all this layer in a single shot. So you can fabricate solar cell uh, quite fast. So, so throughput will be quite large in that sense. Now, if you look at the application, I mean, as I said, like there are a lot of applications where silicon may not be the uh, uh, possible one. So uh, let us start with these uh, windows, like nice windows here. So this, this can be like, uh, like we use tinted glass, right? Instead of tinted glass, we can use uh, uh, polymeric solar panels, which will be semi-transparent as well as it will give you the aesthetic beauty to the building. We can have, uh, 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 portable solar uh, charger, mobile charger like this. So you can roll it, you can go somewhere, you can whenever you are just uh, traveling, you can just put it outside for some time and charge your mobile phone. You can have a bag normally in the remote places where you don't have the conventional energy. So you can put it on a bag, it can charge mobile or some other uh, small equipment which can be used later on. Or nowadays actually the concept uh, came that lot of uh, indoor uh, light recycling can be done using all these third generation uh, solar cells. Or you can uh, think about some fancy things. Uh, this is my supervisor, Professor K. S. Narayan. So you can have some sort of a uh, umbrella which can be coated with uh, solar uh, uh, solar cell, like polymeric solar cell, and it, it can power small equipment like that. Right. So what are the materials we use for uh, solar cells? Definitely the, uh, the I mean, like if you look at the plethora of materials, like there are there a are lot of materials. I cannot just put it in a single slide, maybe like uh, thousands of uh, donor and acetone materials, uh, thanks to all this uh, beautiful uh, chemistry and the chemist, those who have made uh, these polymers, very nice polymers. It could be donor type polymers or uh, in, in terms of like if I, if I uh, find out the similarities with inorganic semiconductors. You can call it, these are sort of like P-type polymers and you can have the acceptor polymers or uh, the counterpart could be like N-type inorganic semiconductors. So you need donor and acceptor materials uh, to uh, fabricate polymer solar cell. Now, the beauty is you, you can control its HOMO and LUMO and as well as the band gap. So you can, you can design your materials such a way that you uh, get the uh, desired band gap as well as your homo lumo uh, levels. So these are some of the typical polymers used for uh, solar cell applications. And you can see like the, how this band gap uh, looks like depending on the like PTSD, PCP, DTBT. And these are some of the uh, most commonly used uh, uh, donor materials like PCBM. It could be like C60-based PCBM. It could be C70-based PCBM and so on. So here comes the beauty of uh, the, uh, the uh, theoretical aspect of it, right? So if you want to design a new materials, new uh, polymers, you start with monomers. So uh, the uh, theoretician, they predict the structure of it. Like you, you can have the structure and you can calculate the, uh, the electron density and uh, same as like your homolomo band gap. Definitely if you go from <coughs> a single molecule to dimer, Two oligomer, you can see the uh, the, uh, the uh, energy kinetics changes as well as the uh, electronic properties changes, right? So uh, here is one of the example you can see. Like if you look at the single uh, molecules or just a monomer, 
the uh, homo lumo energy band gap is somewhere like uh, 3.4 eb to go to monomer to dimer that that can reduce to 2.6 uh, eb from dimer to oligomer it will be further reduced and from oligomer to if you go to polymer it will be reduced however you have to remember that even if you make say 100 units of polymer chain only few of them are conjugated or the conjugation length uh, relies on only like 5 to 6 unit and that is what uh, gives you the uh, band gap it, it doesn't like the long chain hydrocarbon folds whenever it, there is a bending or folding the conjugation lost and you, you lose the uh, electronic properties there so the conjugation length only uh, stay up to like uh, 5 to 6 units right and, there, and then there is a break and then another conjugation length and so on but uh, you can control the uh, homo lumo or electronic properties, their optical as well as electronic properties by uh, looking at all these molecules, their arrangement, their tilting angle, and so on. Here is one example, like you can see, uh, if you change the functional group, uh, like this is a dicuto polypyrrole, DPP core, if you change it to thiophene or benzene or uh, pyridine, you can change the angle here, this, this angle, uh, here, right? So this is thiophene, this is uh, uh, benzene, this is uh, pyridine. So their uh, homolumo energy level also changes depending on the interaction between these. So that is what all this beauty of like uh, density functional theory calculation, GFT calculation, to uh, give the uh, fundamentals of uh, band structure in these uh, materials. Now, if I if I uh, look at the uh, properties which is essential for organic solar cells, we should keep some parameters in mind. For example, when you excite any polymer, it creates electron and hole, they are strongly bound and the binding energy is somewhere like 0.4 electron volt. These are called Frenkel type excitons. Unlike in inorganic semiconductors, when you excite inorganic semiconductors, uh, they are very loosely bound electron hole pair, they are called like motor type, and the uh, binding energy is only few milli electron volt, which is thermally dissociable. However, for polymer, they're very strongly bound. It's order of like hundreds of uh, electron uh, milli electron volt that cannot be dissociated using thermal energy. Th remember, thermal energy is only 25 milli electron volt at room temperature. So they're not dissociable. Second is the exciton diffusion length. This is only 10 nanometers. So whenever you generate any exciton, that can diffuse up to 10 nanometer before, before it recombines or dissociate. So if it doesn't recombine, it will definitely, uh, uh, doesn't dissociate, it will definitely recombine and it will give you either light or it can be like non-radiative recombination. So you lose the uh, photon energy there. Third, it absorbs a significant amount. You can say like alpha is uh, 10 to five centimeter inverse. So you need only 100 nanometer thick film Unlike silicon where you need hundred, hundreds of micron thick film to absorb significant amount of light. Here you need only 100 nanometer thick film to absorb uh, light. Now comes the architecture. So uh, if I say like we have to split the excitons before it recombines. So you can have the donor acceptor heterojunction. Why do we need heterojunction? Because there is a energy offset between donor LUMO level and acceptor LUMO level, and the exciton can break at the uh, interface, right? Now, this is another aspect, like we need 100 nanometer thick film to absorb light. So if I say like donor is basically the optically active materials, and this is 100 nanometer thick. So when you sign light, majority of the light will be absorbed at the interface here, right? But only few can travel towards the acceptor interface and gets dissociated, right? So then what will happen is most of the excitons which are generated close to the one of the I2 interface, they will be lost. Only those who are around the acceptor donor interface, they will be basically uh, uh, split into three charges and that can be collected by the cathode materials and you can have uh, uh, some charge collection and that will act like a solar cell, right? Now, what is the ideal uh, structure? Can we improve this interface? So, so that is sort of like uh, engineer's dream to get some such kind of interpenetrating or interdigitated 
structure of donor and acceptor materials. Like you can see, the interface is much more here. So if any exciton generates here, that can easily diffuse. So this length is within 20 nanometers. So it can easily diffuse to the interface, gets split into three charges, and gets collected by the cathode and uh, respective anode materials, and then gets transported through this uh, uh, electrode, right? But patterning this kind of uh, design, as I said, this is a dream for uh, uh, the scientists to get this kind of donor and acceptor interface. That's not very feasible. So there are a lot of methods people have used using uh, nanotube approach and other approach. I will not go to that details. But then can we simplify this structure into something like this? This is called bulk heterojunction structure, which is uh, discovered by Higar group in 1997. And that is what uh, the uh, polymer solar cell, actually, that is sort of like breakthrough in this uh, field, I would say. What they have done is they have taken polymer and the uh, acceptor materials, mix them in a common solvent, blend it, and allow them to basically demix, right? So there is some sort of like uh, spinodal phase segregation between uh, donor and acceptor materials. So you, you get some sort of a domain-like structure like this. So whenever you sign light, there will be some charge generation or the exciton generation around that regime that can split into free charges whenever they reach one of the interface. And then we are hoping that all these uh, domain-like structure has some sort of a like continuity or network to uh, travel these respective uh, carriers. Like in uh, donor, it will be hole, and in acceptor phase, it will be electron and reach to the counter electrode and vice versa. So again, this is a lot of engineering uh, necessary here to get the morphology. Maybe uh, that is what I'll be talking about today, how to control this morphology in this scale, in this length scale, right? So that is what when you generate uh, charge carrier and uh, you collect them at the uh, cathode and uh, anode interface, you get the uh, efficient solar cell. So that is sort of like breakthrough in this uh, polymer solar cell uh, research. Now, if I take uh, a typical uh, bulk heterojunction solar cell, you have a donor and acceptors. So uh, we have some sort of a scheme here. You can see whenever you sign light, you generate electron and hole uh, exciton, basically at the uh, P3ST, then it uh, travel to the uh, P3ST PCBM interface. These are all energy levels of, this is HOMO, this is GLOMO for P3ST, this is HOMO, and uh, this is GLOMO for PCBM. They split into free charges and uh, hop through the uh, phases, like P3ST phase, and PCBM phase, and finally collected by the uh, cathode and anode electrode respectively. And if you look at the typical IV curve, uh, so you can see uh, like whenever you sign light, you get IV curve something like this. So there are some key parameters like uh, open circuit voltage, short circuit current, and uh, maximum power. So now if you divide uh, this square by this bigger square like ISC and VOC, you can. Uh, Draw another rectangle here rather than square, I would say like rectangle. So the ratio between this rectangle and if I draw another imaginary rectangle using ISC and VOC, uh, you get this field factor. The more the square shape of this uh, IV curve, you get the higher and higher efficiency. And that's what the efficiency can be calculated by VOC times ISC times field factor divided by the optical power or uh, sunlight, optical power in. So that is the typical efficiency of the device. Now, if you look at the efficiency of the device, it is not so simple. There are a lot of steps and all the efficiencies actually uh, multiplied, right? They are not algebraic sum, they are sort of like product function. So if one of the component is very low, then overall efficiency goes down. So this is the incident photon to current conversion efficiency. That's the electrons in external circuit divided by the incident photon. And it can have the absorption efficiency charge extraction efficiency or exciton diffusion efficiency, charge transport and charge collection. So absorption, again, absorption depends on what kind of polymer we are using. It's followed basically via Lambert's law, right? Uh, if the alpha is more, definitely you need thinner and thinner film. You can easily absorb 66% uh, uh, of uh, light or a bit more than that if you increase the thickness. Then comes the uh, exciton dissociation that depends on the uh, the offset energy offset of donor and acceptor, and there are a lot of other photophysics here. So it's not only the energy offset, there has to have some sort of a like 
uh, frontal orbital overlap, like uh, lumo level of donor materials and lumo level, uh, lumo level of acceptor materials. That has to have some sort of a, like physical overlap such that electron can easily get transported. Then you have the uh, uh, charge transport through the respective uh, media, like you have the uh, donor media and acceptor media. Charge has to hop through these media. These these materials are inherently disordered. They are not very uh, crystalline. So the charge transport is also uh, very slow or low. So that also you need to keep in mind. And finally, uh, how efficiently we are able to collect all these free charges from the respective electrode side, like from the cathode side, cathode side, as well as anode side, like collecting electrons as well as holes from the respective electrodes. And that is what overall efficiency matters, right? So you have all these four products. If one of them are uh, uh, less than uh, one, per, I mean, like uh, very small, right? then the product function also goes down. So everything has to be close to unity and then only you can get very high efficiency number. Now in uh, polymer solar cell, we can typically uh, assume like there are some sort of a, like spaghetti-like structure. These are the polymers and most widely used uh, acceptor material is fullerene or buckyball and the functional form of it like uh, PCBM, like it could be C60BS, it could be C70BS, right? Now when you shine light, you can see like these are all polymer excitons. This is the charge transfer uh, state. This is the free ball arounds. This is the Coulomb capture radius exciton diffusion and polar transport. So what happened when you sign light? This creates some sort of a like uh, electron hole pair excitons and that can diffuse towards the interface where it can split into, uh, before it splits actually it forms some sort of a like charge transfer complex. Like the electron is in donor phase, uh, sorry, acceptor phase and hole is in uh, donor phase. And they are still columbically bound though the binding energy is lesser than this excitonic binding energy but still they are columbically bound. And if the radius is more than the uh, Coulomb capture radius, then it will split into free charges. Like the electron can go this way and hole can go this way, right? And the way these charges moves, it's not like a free charge, rather they are called polaron. Polaron means these charges are sort of uh, bound to the uh, lattice vibration. So the it's a deformational state. So it's a partial charge which is bound to this or the polymer chain or the uh, the chlorine uh, in that sense, and they are uh, transported along with the thermal vibration. So it's a hopping mechanism, and that's what this charge get transported. Now we can also look at the Jablonski diagram. That's sort of like kinetics. You can see. So here you can see like when you excite any uh, materials, donor materials, you you excite basically from the singlet uh, ground state to uh, singlet excited states. And then it thermally uh, come, come to the bottom of the excited states. So then it can either radiatively decay or non radiatively decay, depending on the spin uh, polarization, right? Or it can diffuse to the, the uh, uh, interface here. So when exciton diffuse, uh, it goes to the donor uh, interface, it can split into like uh, the uh, singlet state or it can go to the triplet state. Triplet state are sort of long lived state and then finally decay to uh, ground state non radiatively right? Singlet state can go to the charge separation state, right? This is the charge separation state where you have the charges in the uh, uh, two phases like donor and acceptor phases, but they're still columbically found. And you can see one fourth of them are uh, the uh, triplet states uh, coming back to the recombination again. Three fourth goes to the uh, uh, free carriers. So, so that is what the free carriers is. And finally, charge gets extracted. So this this uh, scale, you can say like space and time, definitely as you go on this process, uh, process has a finite time. So this is normally uh, uh, somewhere in uh, picoseconds. So this uh, uh, femto to picosecond time scale, this uh, recommendation rate, when it recommends from the this state, it can be like biomolecular recommendation that is somewhere in nanoseconds state, and these are even slower. So faster at this recommendation rate, it will go this way, and uh, the further reaction will be much slower. So your target would be design material such a way that this state is much faster than this decay rate, such that you have more and more 
free charges and that can be extracted here. So that's what this is uh, time and uh, space scale and this is the energy scale. And also you can see you whatever energy you excite, when you collect it, you lose a lot of energy in every step. And that is what the reason for uh, the decrease in efficiency. So there is a uh, thermodynamic limit. We cannot get more than the uh, thermodynamic limit of your device efficiency. So this is one example you can see uh, your uh, current density goes down as you goes from like 100% to 85% external quantum efficiency. And this is this chart, like how the, uh, the, uh, how the open circuit voltage uh, depends on the band gap. Definitely higher the uh, uh, band gap, you get higher and higher open circuit voltage, but at the same time, you uh, absorb lower and lower photon energy. You lose the current density. So there is an optimization process. And somewhere like around 1.4 EV uh, band gap is uh, supposed to be the ideal where you get the maximum efficiencies, right? So uh, how do we lose energy at the interface? So as I said, like you have the uh, donor materials, you have the acceptor materials. When you excite them, you have uh, the high energy excitons, which diffuse to the interface and it splits into free charges. And every step you see, there is a drop in energy. For example, like if I look at the exciton here, you absorb this much of energy, but when it creates the exciton, it needs some sort of a binding energy that is delta uh, or you can call it like EB, this energy is sort of lost. Now, when it moves to the uh, donor to acceptor interface, you lose this much of energy because there is an energy offset between donor and acceptor. So all this reorganization of uh, molecules, uh, basically you lose the energy by thermal means. So that further there is a loss in energy when it forms the charge transfer state this is the binding energy for the charge transfer state. And finally, you get this energy of this much. So you start with this and you end up with this. And that is what one reason you don't get open circuit voltage close to your band gap. Rather, it is almost like 1.3 to 1.4 volt lesser than the, uh, the band gap. And every state you can see uh, what is the shift in energy here. Right? So that is what the reason like you excite and when you uh, finally get your energy somewhere much lower than the uh, excitation energy and you lose a lot of energy uh, by thermal means and your open circuit voltage uh, gets reduced. So th this is the kinetics and it depends on the non radiative pathways. Had the non radiative pathways, you lose more and more. So this is the uh, typical structure. This is called like electronic coupling in this equation. And uh, this is the shift you can see here. E00 is basically the shift between the excited state and the uh, ground state energy, right? And so on. So uh, in this graph, you can see this is the uh, theoretical prediction. What should be the open circuit voltage as a function of charge transfer state energy? But what you get, this is the theoretical limit. And what you get is somewhere almost like 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. So this is like 0 0.4. So that's around 0.2, 0.3 less voltage you get. And that is what, as I said, the efficiency is product of voltage, current, and the fill factor. So if I keep a set fill factor, it is the product of voltage and current. So if the voltage drops, the efficiency also uh, drops there. Now here comes the important factor. Now how important is the morphology is? So this is one uh, paper you can see. Uh, if, you, if you change the donor and acceptor ratio, you can create a different kind of morphology. So this is with 0.1 to 0.9% donor acceptor ratio. This is donor, this is acceptor. You can see how the uh, morphology changes from this. So around somewhere like 0.4 to 0.5, you get the maximum fraction of two materials, right? And this is some sort of a like domain size and uh, like around 0.5, 0 0.4 to 0.6 or maybe around 0.5, we get the minimum domain size at as it goes on this way and this way on either side. Either it will be like PCBM rich or P3 ST rich. So the, here you can see this is the P3 ST uh, fraction. So you can see uh, this is 0.1% uh, or uh, I would say like 10% PCBM, 90% P3 ST. So this is mostly P3 ST rich and this is only uh, PCBM, uh, PCBM rich. So this is the other side of it. So 
you can control morphology definitely by uh, changing the ratio but we have to see like which percentage will give me the highest efficiency as i said like the morphology play very significant role here now to control the morphology uh, people have been uh, doing a lot of uh, engineering aspect like uh, thermal annealing solvent annealing using additive this is the uh, uh, figure where they have used solvent to additive ratio as you keep on increasing solvent to additive ratio you get uh, higher and higher order parameter so it has a better uh, morphology like this right so you can uh, look at the morphology how it evolves with different different additive ratio so if you want to control the domain size you can play with lot of uh, parameters like the temperature during the uh, process you can play with the different solvent or you can add different different additives uh, which will give you different morphologies and so on so this is some sort of a like uh, dissipative particle dispersion model uh, dpd uh, simulations where you uh, take basically p3st that's the donor uh, polymer you take uh, uh, solvent it could be chloramine it could be chloroform it could be any other solvent which is basically soluble uh, this p3st and pcbm both are soluble then you can have pcbm you can have uh, octane diethyl that is some sort of an additive mix them in a uh, common solvent and allow them to settle down basically in the simulation what uh, they do is they look at all this uh, molecular interaction uh, from like uh, molecule uh, like don't uh, the self interaction as well as the mutual interaction of solvent to the molecule and uh, allow them to settle for some time so then you start to see some sort of a phase segregation of pcbm rich area p3st rich area and then some uh, uh, additive which can be removed later on by annealing and these are kind of a, a density field distribution and if you uh, convert it to some sort of a like uh, graph theory profile you can see there are some domain of p3st and some domain of uh, pcbm this is the electron donor material is electron acceptor materials so this is the pcbm rich this is the p3st rich area and that is what the uh, bulk hydrojunction structure could look like now the point is how do we control i mean because we don't have the control of interaction of each and every molecules at the uh, molecular level right we can choose a different solvent we can choose different additive but still we don't have very much control this is the simulated simulated data mind it so you can see there are some domain which are very small which are there are some domain which are very big so overall uh, this is still not very efficient way to make the uh, bulk hydrojunction where you, you should get the highest number now is there a need for new tool for like self assemble uh, like btst and uh, pcbm that is what uh, my project comes when i joined like dv group they have already uh, they were already looking at uh, this kind of uh, morphology and they are trying to control this morphology in uh, different ways so uh, just to summarize uh, bulk hydrojunction uh, here we can see like you have btst rich area right uh, and there could be like other crystalline or there could be amorphous same as like you have pcbm rich area or pcbm domain they could be again like crystallized or amorphous but mostly uh, whenever you have the crystallized uh, crystalline to the p3st phase that pushes all this pcbm out to the amorphous region so this amorphous region of p3st are basically dominated by the pcbm and uh, and vice versa right so you can think about uh, there are some small domain which are uh, p3st and uh, there are some small domain which are basically pcbm domain and now if you look at the overall thickness of the film it could be around 150 to 200 nanometers but this small domain should be ideally this should be around 20 nanometer as i said like if the 10 nanometer uh, division again there is a lot of debate whether the division length is 10 nanometer or not but for the timing if i assume there is a 10 nanometer division length this domain has to be within 20 nanometer such that this uh, generated charge carrier can move to the respective uh, domain like uh, uh, respective interfaces right now if i carefully look at this domain we can say this is a uh, p3st domain and this is a pcbm domain so we propose model now you take all this domain and make it like a spherical uh, ball here right and uh, we can also think about like we can have a small domain of p3st and pcbm and make a spherical ball here now there comes the uh, nanoparticle approach so in the first process we can think about 
we take all this polymer make a uh, spherical nanoparticles we take all this acceptor materials like pcbm uh, make a spherical nanoparticles and uh, basically pack them in a geometrical packing and get a morphology which will be much more useful or much more control than this bulk reduction morphology because in this case you need thermal annealing you need solvent annealing you need additive at the same times moment you change your solvent moment you change your polymer moment you change your acceptor materials all three things doesn't work together so there will be different uh, thermodynamics altogether or kinetics of this mixing altogether right but if you make this nanoparticle much more controlled doesn't matter whether you take say p3ht doesn't matter whether you take pcbm they could be easily packed using uh, geometrical packing right so that is what the nanoparticle approach is so this is a quite uh, useful technique you can uh, do uh, uh, minimalism method it is uh, discovered by katherine lampaster from uh, germany so what uh, she did is uh, or she proposes just uh, take any organic uh, solvent dissolve your uh, organic materials like for example we can take say p3ht or uh, pcbm and then add it to a surfactant solvent like you have the water with some surfactant molecules right and then this this uh, orange color is basically the organic compound then you do the ultrasonication what you do is basically you break all this oil immersion into a tiny uh, droplet right moment you make them a very tiny droplet all the surfactant mole molecule basically surfactant molecule has a hydrophilic tail and hydrophobic head right or vice versa so what happen is uh, this hydrophobic part goes into the organic part and hydrophilic uh, part goes into the surfactant and then it stabilizes the uh, mini emulsion or uh, mini droplet so and then when you remove the organic solvent all this polymer actually collapses into a small particles or the uh, pcbm collapses into a small particle and the surfactant actually wrapped around the um uh, particle and stabilize in water so ultimately what you get is a water dispersion of nanoparticles right so there are a couple of advantages here so normally all this uh, uh, the solvent we use for organic solar cell they are either halogenated like uh, dichlorobenzene chlorobenzene chloroform they are very toxic you can try some non halogenated like toluene or xylene but still there are some carcinogenic effect later on people have tried alcohol methanol but making the film is very difficult they are much better than this but not absolutely uh, eco friendly and then if you can make it in water like uh, dispersion in water they are definitely environmental friendly so this process is not only to control the morphology but this also gives you the eco friendly uh, approach right if you want to make large area device and if you want to do roll to roll printing the solvent has to be water so that that is what it is right now the idea is one thing and executing is a different issues so when we start this project a lot of challenges how to control the particle size so you can see uh, here is one example if you increase the surfactant molecules you can reduce the particle size remember like you need to make a smaller and smaller nanoparticle such that you can control your uh, morphology in a much better ways right so uh, to control the particle size you can increase the surfactant molecule you can start with somewhere like 90 nanometer particle to somewhere like 30 nanometer particle we are still not the 20 nanometer domain size but we are towards that regime right and at the same times you can tune some sort of a uh, solvent effect there and you can tune the the uh, molecular aggregate so if you look at the 0 0 0 1 and uh, 0 2 peak of this uh, p3st absorption you can see uh, there is enhancement of uh, 0 0 peak with respect to 0 0 peak so it increases the uh, h and j aggregate in this material so that also good for uh, solar cell application by uh, like if you can have more and more and more h aggregates so i'll not uh, go into the details of like uh, how the polymer packs here rather a lot of simulation work can be done or prediction can be done how this uh, polymer can be packed in a molecule sphere now when you make nanoparticle using some sort of a surfactant surfactant is nothing but the long hydrocarbon chain 
definitely there is a key question whether this surfactant will affect the uh, particle packing as well as uh, will it affect the charge transport ultimately we need to make some sort of a opto electronic device where you need very good charge transport through this nanoparticles if they are not well packed if there is surfactant uh, between two uh, nanoparticles definitely it will affect the uh, uh, charge transport and that's comes the second uh, work where we demonstrated that uh, by doing a lot of uh, processing such as like removing excess surfactant we can get very nice very close packing they are not uh, very uniformly packed but they are very close packed so you can see all these uh, particles here and we have measured the uh, time of flight mobility measurement they are quite good uh, compa comparable to the uh, pristine polymer uh, so here you can see the, still there are some holes and there are some gaps there is some microstructure micro structural defects which are still not completely resolved and that's what uh, we'll discuss later on like what is the impact of that so here is one example like when you make this nanoparticle as i said like you can move from different polymer to different polymer here one example that we have cho chosen two uh, polymer one is a uh, 72 kilodalton uh, 2p3 ht basically 72 kilodalton with 92 viscosity this viscosity is quality viscosity index is 2.7 there is another uh, polymer Uh, molecular weight is 30 kilo dalton very high dose regular and the polarity sparsity index is even lower like 1.7 now these are two uh, p3st now if you make uh, this thin films by by drop cast and anneal them you see p2 shows much higher mobility than the p1 uh, polymer but as cast film they are somewhere within this range right so because if you don't anneal they are basically random without any uh, crystallinity or nano crystallinity so they give uh, uh, mobility somewhere here so the question is when you anneal it why one of the polymer shows a uh, drop in mobility and other shows the increase in mobility that is because how this uh, p3st chain are packed one case is it is is on packing so the polymer chains are basically standing on the uh, uh substrate which is basically like this stacked like this way so the vertical uh, charge transport is much lower other one is like face on packing so p2 actually because the lower molecular weight polymer they stack on face on packing so that can easily be packed like this way so the vertical transport becomes much easier where p1 this vertical transport becomes much uh, weaker now if you make them as a nano particle then you basically control this is on on face on packing and you can easily get this mobility which will be in the range of uh, 2 to 5 into 10 to minus 4 uh, 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 volts again right so then you can bring all these materials into the same uh, roof right for the device application so that is another advantage you can see like uh, you can bring uh, p1 or p2 both will act uh, equivalently basically but then comes the device right this is this is what i i would say like this sort of like uh, uh, the challenge for the scientist sometimes you get sort of a like nightmare you have all these brilliant ideas you start with uh, fabricating device and then finally you end up with like 0.08 or even sometimes like 1.006% recent device and you uh, lose hope right so it was not uh, that easy to make the film using all this water uh, soluble uh, ink right these are these these nanoparticles are dispersed in water so getting the film was extremely challenging and that's what uh, the initial uh, device shows uh, like almost zero efficiency but this is non zero uh, by the way so that is what like a little bit of hope like uh, if even if a patient is in ventilator right you still have some hope that it will come out he will come out or she will come out So it is something like that. The device is not dead. Is, there is some, still some hope. We can we can uh, uh, like make it better. So that's a non-zero value. So after a lot of uh, processing, so there are uh, three major challenges like low viscosity, thinner films. They're not able to get it. Slow drying process, non-uniform film and crack formations, and then uh, substrate oil coatability. So uh, whenever you have a lot of surfactant that doesn't wet the surface, so it's it's uh, very difficult to. make the surface weight so after overcoming all three challenges 
we were able to make the efficient device. Now it is more than 22, 2.2% uh, for uh, P3ST. And there are report from uh, some other group, those who have reported over 7 to 8%, which actually supersede the bulk retention device structure. I'll come to that point later on. But this is a P3ST device, which is normally uh, BHJ device shows somewhere like a, a 3%, but uh, we can uh, get uh, like nanoparticle device somewhere like 2 to 2.2% recent device. So after all this optimization, we were able to make good quality film and uh, we, we got uh, the device uh, which we, we are looking for. So uh, these are some of the device you can see like how the device efficiency changes with the different different processing conditions. And uh, also like uh, if you look at the uh, uh, optimized device with the ethanol wash, basically that is what we uh, try to remove the excess surfactant. We can go up to like 2.2 or 2.15% efficient device with a good fill factor with a decent uh, BS, it is still not up to the mark. Current density is to some extent uh, quite okay. Right. So uh, these are the typical device parameters with different different samples. You start with uh, very low efficiency and finally we end up somewhere uh, uh, around 2% device efficiency. So that is what our different samples are. Right. So this is one example you can see like, this is over 2% device, but the uh, series resistance is lower, sun resistance is higher, uh, fill factor is over 67 uh, percent, current density is this. So these nanoparticles are synthesized at 70 degrees centigrade. So that's a lower, 70, uh, lower temperature, slightly higher efficiency device and so on. Right, and so we wanted to look at why this device efficiency is still not up to the mark. So first is we wanted to check whether there is some bulk effect or some interfacial effect. So what we did is uh, we did some sort of a, uh, the intensity dependent measurement, like starting with very low intensity to high intensity and look at the current. And if the current is proportional to intensity, then it follows the uh, linear behavior here. And that means there is not much of biomolecular recombination loss. So there is not much of loss in the bulk, right? Efficiency is not limited by the biomolecular recombination, at least up to the uh, the uh, one sun uh, photon flux. Right. Now then we move to like uh, blend nanoparticle. As I said, like blend nanoparticle means we have uh, P3ST and PCBM into a single nanoparticles, and then we can have the separate nanoparticles where you have separate P3ST and separate PCBM nanoparticles. Here we have much better controls. You can change the particle size, you can change the particle ratio, you can change the relative uh, number as well. So this is what example of like 80 uh, nanometer blend nanoparticles, 80 nanometer uh, separate nanoparticles and so on. So you can see how the efficiency varies. And you can see separate nanoparticles, it's still increasing. Right? If you go to even smaller and smaller, probably you'll have a higher efficiency, but there are some other experimental challenges. Whereas the uh, uh, blend nanoparticles, normally it's saturated somewhere because uh, after sometimes, even if you make a smaller nanoparticles, you cannot control the domain size within the nanoparticles itself. So there are some other challenges. So this is what EQE data, you can see like it's almost like 40%, it's still not up to the mark, maybe like I would expect somewhere like 60 to 80% uh, uh, external quantum efficiency, then you can have much higher efficiency here. So here, what we have demonstrated is uh, separate nanoparticle with two is to one actually shows the higher efficiency than one is to one or four is to one. So you can control the number ratio to control the morphology as well. So here is uh, AFM image. You can see these are all small particles. There are some uh, buffer layer to get the higher and higher numbers, right? Now, to look at more into the uh, device aspect, what we did is we uh, did some sort of a uh, time applied mobility measurement for separate nanoparticles, they're much lower. Then we have only vitreous nanoparticles that somewhere here. And then we have the blend, blend nanoparticles, which actually behave something like this. So if you look at the field dependent behavior, it decreases. And uh, from the mobility uh, theoretical uh, calculations, you can say like, this behavior comes because of two parameters. One is called the disorder parameters. One is the 
energetic disorder one is the positional disorder so this is the energetic disorder parameters this is the positional disorder parameters and the relative strength of energy to positional so if we have hard positional disorder basically you have uh, negative uh, field dependence and that is what we have observed here so th this beta is basically this so that this is negative or positive play a big role how this uh, field dependent behavior would look like so then one of my colleague actually uh, did some sort of a uh, theoretical investigation of it so this theory is basically the drift diffusion uh, model like you have the nanoparticle assemblies here so you have uh, two electrodes you can have two electrodes you can start putting all this buffer layer like pcbm you can put pcbm p3st uh, sorry p dot pss or you can put pcbm and p dot pss and look at the charge transport through all these devices and uh, she found out that uh, whenever you have p3st uh, uh, sorry uh, pcbm and uh, p dot buffer layer you get the highest efficiency numbers and the conclusion is the key challenge for the uh, surface defect states so after doing all this theoretical investigation using a drip diffusion model and trapped uh, density calculations what we found out this uh, found out that the surface defect states basically play a significant role here and that is what we lose uh, the open circuit voltage and also during the uh, nanoparticle synthesis we introduce lot of uh, uh, doping to the polymer so these polymers become highly conductive rather than semiconductive and that is one reason we uh, start to lose efficiency in these devices right so here you can see like how the blend nanoparticles and separate nanoparticles charge transport would look like in blend nanoparticles definitely you have co continuous pathways of uh, p3st and pcbm rich area because both the all these particles will have the p3st rich domain and pcbm rich domain and that is what you can have the path length whereas if you have only p3 or pcbm separate nanoparticles they have to hop through individual particles and uh, the length scale would be more than the length of this uh, device right so here you can see the average distance order of the uh, length of the uh, device or the thickness of the device i would say and uh, in this case uh, the uh, the length uh, average carrier travel is more than the thickness of the Uh, device right so uh, the conclusion is if you have a conventional device fabrication you have p3st and pcbm or basically you can say like uh, polymer and pcbm that is the uh, molecular scale and then you have very limited control of aggregate like how this polymer and pcbm aggregates and then you have very limited control over morphology and that's what you get the bulk heterojunction morphology our approach what we do is you take uh, basically uh, polymer and uh, donor acceptor separately make them in a spherical nanoparticles and then pack them by geometrical packing so you have a uh, molecular assembly here you can control the aggregate structure within this particle and then you can tune the morphology depending on the particle size particle ratio and the uh, number ratios right so we have finally demonstrated that we can make the uh, flexible device using uh, this approach right so this is the flexible device uh, made in lab and that is what we can have the control from nanometer uh, less than a nanometer that is the molecular level to uh, order of 10 to 100 nanometer that is the nano scale assemblies and then you can go to the mesoscale or microstructure which is greater than 100 nanometers and it is also compatible to roll to roll right but life is not so simple right as i said like the bhj device is still outperforming our nanoparticle device so why we are losing the efficiency and what is the reason behind that and that is what we started uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, study after the uh, after fabricating these two devices here you can see uh like uh this one is the nanoparticle based device this is the polymer based device nanoparticle device shows even higher current than the uh, bhj device so this is limited current we can measure the mobility and we can find out a lot of parameters there now why are we lose so we have taken two device here one is nanoparticle of uh, uh, so, uh, like efficiency of around 2% and this device efficiency is around 2.7% both have 
similar uh, current density, uh, almost similar field factor, but the major difference you can see is here is the voltage. So in this case, it is 0.44, even much lower than 0.57. So we have chosen two uh, solar cells, which has uh, similar current density, but uh, different uh, open circuit voltage. And uh, if you look at the uh, log log semi log plot, you can see the uh, nanoparticle has a higher current density than the BAJ device. So we started digging into it, uh, basically looking at the capacitance measurement, uh, mod short key measurement, and mod short key measurement, you can see like how the slope had the uh, uh, lower the charge concentration at the interface, lower the slope, slope at the charge concentration at the interface. So this is, the, this is in bulk, this is under light, and, and you can see if you look at the flat band potential from the mod short key plot also you can find out the flat band potential here and there is a shift of around 1.13 uh, volt which is nothing but the uh, loss we have and you can see uh, the uh, bhj device under light illumination the flat band potential is almost zero so it matches but for the uh, nanoparticle device the flat band potential is around 0.13 and that is what this loss is right so if you look at the uh, interface of these uh, two device, so one is BHJ, when it uh, makes in contact with the cathode and anode materials, you can say there are some trapped states or defect density of states at the uh, cathode interface. And that gives you some sort of a like uh, depletion layer in the cathode interface, right? Same as like this. So when you sign light, all these trapped states are filled and you have the quasi formulable splitting of holes and electrons, and that gives you the open circuit voltage, right? Now, comes to the nanoparticle device. Again, here we have the uh, trapped states, and these are quite large compared to the this one. This is sort of distributed. So you have large depletion layer. Here we have the uh, smaller depletion layer, probably not very clear from this uh, image here. But the bottom line is you have still a lot of uh, defect states under illumination, which push this Fermi level up, right? This EFP up. And that is what the uh, the difference between these two levels are much lower, right? So here you get higher VOC for BHG device. You, here you get lower VOC for MPOBB device. This is recently published. Now to understand that actually, uh, we did impedance spectroscopy analysis. This is a, a brief theory of that. So if you take any device, you, you can look at the IV curve. Now any nonlinear device would show something like this, right? Now, if you apply a very small sinusoidal voltage here, you can get a very small sinusoidal current, right? And you can measure the AC impedance as a function of the frequency. And if you plot the frequency here, it shows a different behavior. Definitely, uh, this semicircle comes because of series resistance and uh, capacitance, or rather parallel resistance capacitance combination. So you can see. This is the low frequency side, this is the high frequency side. And uh, at every instant, you can find out what is the uh, real component of it. That is the resistive component, that is the reactive components, imaginary component of it, and so on, right? So uh, uh, in theory, we can also see that like, if this is your voltage, right? There is always a phase shift of your current, like this. So that's, that phase shift actually gives you the the imaginary component of it. If there is no phase shift, that means it's purely resistive, you get a point here, some, somewhere here on the real axis. You don't get any uh, capacitive effect. If there is a 90% phase shift, you get purely capacitive, you get point somewhere here, right? Somewhere in imaginary component. And if you have somewhere uh, less than 90 degree phase shift, that means you have uh, real as well as imaginary component. That is what you see. And then when you change the frequency, definitely the phase shift will depend on the frequency here, delta T, right? And that's what you start to see this kind of a uh, behavior. So this gives a lot of uh, device information, especially like if you look at the interfacial studies, the, uh, the, uh, the impedance spectroscopy play a big role there. So I did some sort of impedance spectroscopy and then uh, definitely a lot of device modeling comes into the picture. So just not the getting the impedance data, but you need to understand a lot of parameters from here. So some cases you get some kind of a behavior like this. So you have two semicircles sort of overlap. So uh, from here you can find out the transport resistance or the recombination resistance. 
or in some cases you don't get this behavior rather these two uh, semicircle are merged such a way that you get only one resistance here which is called uh, like a grisha model so there are different kind of modeling and uh, normally we use gview software which can be used to model these impedance like uh, if you look at the device uh, and this is a distributed network model right so you have anode and cathode you have the active layer which is basically uh, polymer and uh, pcb uh, bulk hydrogen junction you can model like a small distributed network and every distributed network will have the resistance capacitance so these resistance are transport resistance these resistance are basically loss resistance or recombination resistance and then definitely there will be some capacitive effect there are some sort of charge uh, chemical uh, capacitance charge uh, accumulation or uh, storage in the active layer so looking at this uh, information we can get the uh, carrier diffusion length in uh, bulk hydrogen junction film and in vhg film what we observe is at low voltage definitely your uh, transport will be uh, or the uh, the resistance will be dominated by the recombination resistance what we see is the diffusion length is more than the thickness of the film so l is the thickness of the film it's 1.35 times thickness from this two resistance ratio you can find out what is the uh, diffusion length and same as if the diffusion length is less than the uh, film thickness then you don't see this behavior r p r by 3 you don't get this feature you get grisha model right so in uh, nanoparticle we don't see the carrier diffusion length more than the thickness whereas for vhg film we see the carrier diffusion length is more than the thickness that means it can easily travel through the uh, active layer and uh, get collected by the counter electrode whereas the uh, nanoparticle uh, devices it's not this case right you lose lot of carrier because of the recombination but if you look at the open circuit voltages both matches so that is the bulk properties are not affected by the uh, our bulk properties are same for nanoparticle as well as vhg device they both are equal right so also we we'll, uh, found out the lifetime of the free carriers and see there is a shift around 0.14 volt where the lifetime minima which is right and uh, this is our like uh, under light this is under dark under light you can see around 0.13 volt shift between the uh, frequency minima that the uh, lifetime minima happens so lifetime minima is where around the open circuit voltage where uh, all these charge carrier goes under the recombination uh, process so there are different uh, device uh, impedance curve under dark and you can see the uh, separate nanoparticle is slightly different from other nanoparticles and so on right so now if you look at the morphology of these two uh, blend nanoparticles and separate nanoparticle you can see blend nanoparticles domain size are much smaller separate nanoparticles they are still not up to the mark and that is what the reason we we don't get uh, much higher efficiency and also as i said the surface defect states and the uh, the intrinsic doping during synthesis play a big role there and these are some impedance data i'll uh, skip that uh, so uh, those are interested in, uh, they can look for this paper here so the details are given there so from the impedance data you can find out lot of interfacial properties there now is there any hope definitely yes so recently uh, uh, this group has published couple of papers one is in nature communication and another one is in advanced materials and they have demonstrated that by overcoming the microstructural defect which i was talking about the surface defect states if you can remove the surface defect states definitely you can get device efficiency which would be much higher than the even vhg uh, structure so uh, they have done that uh, using uh, some strategy which is called like surfactant stripping like what are the surfactant we choose they have chosen such kind of surfactant which can be Uh, stripped after the nanoparticles are formed and you can see these surfactants are much smaller in length right so they can easily pack or they can assemble in a nice way and then you can get much better charge transport and you don't uh, see the uh, microstructural defect what we have uh, seen normally uh, for other nanoparticle devices and they have achieved uh, significantly for all these uh, polymeric materials which they have recorded more than 7.5% efficiency device and you can see this is the conventional 
uh, polymer nanoparticle device without uh, 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 surfactant stripping. And this is the uh, nanoparticles with surfactant stripping. You can see they're much more well packed. And this is the schematic basically to show that you don't have too much of surfactant and you have much better charge transport and you get much higher efficiency in all these uh, cases. So to summarize this uh, nanoparticle devices, uh, what we have understood is uh, uh, we can control the morphology by uh, molecular scale to macro scale by geometric packing of numb sphere. Uh, these are also very eco-friendly process because these nanoparticles are dispersed in water, so you don't need any organic uh, carcinogenic solvent. We, we can remove the excess surfactant and that will improve the, uh, uh, or that will reduce the interfacial defect states and it can improve the open circuit voltage and thus the efficiency of the device. And that is what these other group have already demonstrated that microstructural defect at the interface can be uh, removed by chemical means and uh, surfactant uh, stripping method. And then can get higher efficiency than even uh, BOJ devices. So the last part of my talk, I'll talk, uh, I'll uh, discuss about how good is the uh, this nanoparticle assembly method. So this is uh, uh, mostly the theoretical uh, calculations. Uh, it's done by uh, Lawrence Rena. He is now a postdoc in uh, Lawrence Bar uh, Barclay, and uh, he did a lot of simulation here and uh, did some sort of a conducting AFM to match with the experimental result to show that. You can control this uh, 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 nano phase domain between two nanoparticles. So, for example, you uh, you take PCHT and uh, this is a polystyrene to make it one is conducting, one is non conducting for the AFM measurement. So, if you take this kind of a structure, you get current whenever you bias between these two electrodes, the uh, cantilever probe tip and the bottom electrode. This current can travel through this path or it can travel through this path. So, you get an envelope of current. With the, uh, different different data, and you can see this is one particular composition where your simulated uh, uh, current, AFM current, and the measured AFM current, they matches quite well. And also, like if you look at the percentage PCHT, as you keep on increasing percentage PCHT, the peak current actually increases. The average current also increases, and that follows some sort of a trend. So there is a threshold be beyond which uh, you start to see very high conducting phase. And depending on what is the percentage of or the, uh, the uh, number ratio of uh, the conducting to non-conducting phase, you get different different predominating structures like the uh, maybe uh, tetragonal prism structure or chain-like structure or branch chain structure. We'll discuss in, uh, in later. So here is the uh, simulation data you can see. So, so this is called random sphere packing. So normally if you uh, pack a uh, spherical particle, if it is a closed pack, you get more than uh, like 0.74%, right? But this is very difficult to get a closed packing by just uh, spare packing method. So it has to have some sort of a electrostatic or van der Waal interaction. But if you just take two particles, it doesn't have that much of electrostatic or van der Waal interaction, it will pack randomly. And random assembly is even better than the packed uh, geometry because you can repeat this quite a large scale. Whereas square packing, like if you have uh, closed packing, it will be very difficult to extend that closed packing for a large scale. Whereas random packing can be extended beyond a uh, very uh, long uh, scale. So that is what uh, random packing is. I would say I uh, sized much better than the closed packing, right? And, but the difficulty is you don't get uh, up to 0 0.74 uh, packing fraction, rather you get like 0.64, around that is the uh, random packing uh, fraction maximum you can get uh, 0.64 packing fraction here. So here you can see the simulated uh, uh, current uh, profile for uh, different different percentages, uh, basically 20, 40, 60, and 80 percentages. And uh, these are sort of like counts versus average effective surface current. You can see as you go on increasing the uh, conducting phase, you get more and more current. As you reduce it, you get less and less current. So you get mostly dark phase or you get uh, mostly the bright phase depending on what is the uh, percentage ratio you choose. So uh, just to uh, match with the experimental re result, 
these are the experimental uh, conducting afm data with the different percentage of uh, uh, p3st and uh, pss uh, polystyrene nanoparticles and you can see uh, the conductivity uh, increases after say 30 to 40 percent of uh, molecular uh, or the number fraction right so that is what you can see the uh, current mode and this is the mode of uh, current versus the uh, the fraction here so uh, had the n eta is basically the conductor had the conducting phase and uh, that's what it is so here you can see this is a quite good agreement with the experimental result to the uh, simulated or theoretical result of the uh, current packing so what we what we see is whenever we have very low percentage of uh, what one of the components so for example if i say like conducting phase low percentage of conducting phase less than 10% mostly they are isolated molecules or isolated uh, particles here now as you keep on increasing the uh, the number fraction here you start to see the formation of dimers right and then it goes to the uh, 1d chain so at, as you keep on increasing it can form the branch chain and that's what when you start to form the 1d chain you start to see the current so that's what around 30% of nodes you start to see the current in the conducting afm measurement then you go to hard percentage somewhere like 40% you, you get the uh, branch chain uh, maybe uh, there are a uh, few few of them but then as i said like all these component will be there on all the times like there will be like branch chain there will be some uh, 1d chain there will be still dimer there will be some isolated uh, particles but predominantly this will be the structure then as you keep on increasing it could be like uh, trigonal prism but there are more defects something like that so this is two defects uh, two defects uh, trigonal prism then as you keep on increasing you can get like one defect trigonal prism and beyond like 80 to 90% you get trigonal prism so that's the generating cluster you get and as you keep on increasing the thickness of the film you can get uh, the, uh, the the mode count basically this is the mode count you can get right? so that means uh, this approach gives you a much better control of uh, uh, morphology uh, morphology uh, over the uh, bhg structure you can get the conducting phase you can take uh, two conducting phase you can take uh, one uh, acceptor type one donor type or you can take like one conducting phase one non conducting phase so conducting non conducting phases are good for thermoelectric applications like where you need uh, or maybe like you can have one electric uh, electron pathways on uh, whole pathways they are well separated so that is what the thermoelectric materials so this kind of nanoparticle approach are very good in uh, assembling solar cell as well as uh, thermoelectric uh, materials application so uh, uh, this is one example you can see uh, how the defect uh creeps in like if you have a branch chain or if you have a single uh, chain there could be some defects here but if you have a branch chain so that's what when you increase the percentage you can have a branched chain and you can see the uh, even if there is a defect direct transport is not possible it can travel through the uh, branch chain and it can reach to the counter electron and that that's what you can get the uh, uh reverse efficiency so this is what at different different percentages you can get the different different mobility here so this is the experimental data to match with the uh, theoretical data so this is what like when we start with the uh, morphology control this is the simulated morphology using sphere packing and you can say depending on different percentage you can get different different morphology which is quite uh, useful for uh, like uh, dispersive particle uh, packing there distribution there so this is quite easy to uh, get it easy Uh, nanoparticle sphere packing so to summarize binary nanoparticle can be used to control morphology at different uh, length scale by changing particle size and number ratio theoretically we can predict the morphology of binary nanoparticles by random sphere packing which can give up to 0.64% definitely it will not give the uh, 0.74% however if you use a different size of nanoparticles like poly dispersity you have one bigger particle one smaller particle you can still increasing this Uh, well, uh, fraction by uh, somehow like you can go to like even 0.68 we have achieved up to 0.68 with two different particle ratios like one is to 10 one is uh, 10 times bigger than the other one and you can achieve like 0.68 uh, packing fraction so there are a lot of possibilities like 
uh, in experiment definitely we don't have the control of uh, polar dispersity so probably you are uh, we can get even higher packing fraction but in uh, theory we can start with uh, size ratio we can start with number ratio you can uh, uh, you can take with uh, different uh, uh, volume right uh, so there are different type, types of nanostructure formation due to the particle particle interaction and the particle ratio so uh, as we have demonstrated it could be like isolated particles dimer chains branch chains or trigonal prism right so there is a threshold ratio below which there is no conduction uh, specifically like uh, below 30% you don't see too much of conduction above 30% because that is what the uh, branch chain uh, start to appear and then we see the conduction right binary nanoparticle assemblies can be used in solar cells and thermoelectric application and maybe some other applications i have not uh, uh, written here with this uh, i would like to uh, thank my group uh, this work i presented it is done mostly with the db group and uh, in collaboration with uh, russell and uh, paul lati from university of massachusetts amherst and uh, that time they were uh, all uh, uh, graduate students now they have um, like uh, graduated already and that is the old group i was working as postdoctoral fellow and uh, now i'm uh, uh, with this group and some work actually definitely are uh, done by this funding apart from like uh, doe and uh, phase gf rc so with this uh, thank you and i'll be happy if there is any questions probably there are some uh, i don't know how the question uh, can be there are some chat messages right yeah yeah okay thank you dr bab for your excellent talk uh, actually uh, it starts from uh, different angle and uh, you have already covered experimental aspects as well as few uh, theoretical aspects so uh, questions are in the question box uh, box so first question asked by uh, shantika uh, what about cost activity of plastic solar cell okay so uh, this is a very challenging uh, question to answer i would say so uh, there are few group actually who have, who have uh, uh, in fact calculated the cost and it turns out to be the major cost is not the uh, materials or process it is the cost about the substrate and the encapsulation so any device you make with this nanoparticles you need a uh, ITO or ITO substrate it could be flexible it could be glass substrate and then you put the encapsulating uh, materials like glass fused glass or maybe some other encapsulating materials and packaging so that cost is more so it is not the cost about the active layer which we uh, deposit so apparently polymers are very expensive but the amount of polymer required to make say 1 meter square area is really really low compared to the substrate and the uh, 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 the encapsulation and that's what the if, if we predict with respect to the uh, conventional device structure it will be almost similar to that range only difference is the conventional device has a stability say for example like silicon has a stability of 20 years but these solar cells uh, till now reported uh, stability up to 2 to 3 years so that is the field study right so although the cost was quite similar to that but the stability is the big issue and as i said the cost major cost is because of the substrate and the encapsulation not the materials right okay the, the next question uh, by santana of giri if you want to design any acceptor or donor molecule and try to make the theoretical model solar cell what are aspects or properties of the donor acceptor we have to look for okay so that is what uh, the uh, the uh, basically the uh, bridging between a chemist and physicist we need so when we look for efficient device or material which can uh, make a we will be looking for few aspects definitely I, i i cannot number it first start with the absorption so your donor very highly absorptive materials so donor materials any materials you design that should have uh, sorry is, is there any internet issues uh, no i am uh, you are audible now i don't know whether any internet issue or not okay so uh, what we look for any materials you design 
to have a low band gap such that it can absorb significant amount of light as material has to be stable second is where is the homo and lumo these two energy levels are very important as far as is concerned at the interface right so if you take any donor and if you have to have a donor materials which will have very good match with the acceptor materials in terms of the lumo level so as i said like there has to have the frontier orbital overlap of donor and acceptor so your design aspect will look for the uh, lumo level of donor and lumo level of acceptor is there any overlap or not right then only there will be uh, charge separation third is what is the reorganization energy of the donor mat acceptor materials whenever there is a charge transfer from uh, donor to acceptor there is a reorganization of energy so if the reorganization energy is positive definitely it will not work it has to have the negative so that means uh, the uh, reaction will be in forward direction right so these are the uh, three aspect apart from the interface right definitely you need to have better hold extraction and better electron extraction uh, layers so any design aspect like synthesizing materials will look for three key factors like absorption their uh, energy level molecular level and the uh, uh, frontier orbital overlap right okay uh, then ियलिंग <laughs> so in some cases people have used uh, rather than ceramics i would say like uh, uh, some sort of a uh, polymeric insulating phase to make a better quality film but as you keep on increasing the non conducting phase in active layer you hinder the charge transport so you have to keep in mind uh, ceramics will do the same thing so ceramics can give you some sort of a like mechanical stability probably but definitely it will hinder your charge transport properties so uh yeah so that that i think we have a few more questions i think we are uh, we can take that or yes yes yeah, yeah we yeah. do have some time right yeah. yes yes yeah, we have uh, we so, have couple uh, of questions from uh, dr madhumita das sarkar she is a faculty mm -hmm. uh, of vlsi from macau uh, okay. i think if, if you can read or yeah, i should uh, read it out so uh, blended nano particle makes yeah. uh, proper building ultimately leads to new kind of materials properties or nano composite or alloy so these uh, so normally we talk about uh, alloy for inorganic semiconductors but these are sort of uh, polymeric materials so there is no like structural aspect these materials basically uh, uh, blends again i mean that's what it's a blend but uh, as i said like uh, uh, depending on what polymer and what uh, acceptor materials we choose uh, they are nano crystalline normally pcs when you analyze it it forms some sort of a uh polycrystalline uh, or nano crystalline phases and push the uh, pcbm materials out of the crystalline phase so pcbm goes to the amorphous phase so any polymeric materials will have some nano crystalline domain and some uh, amorphous phase so where the uh, pcbm goes there so uh, whether we should call it nano composite i would say no it is still a blend so you have the uh, nano crystalline uh, polymer phase and the amorphous phase where pcbms are sitting there how can mobility be measured okay uh, normally if if you want to measure uh, mobility of a slightly thicker film of micron then time of flight measurement is the best way to do otherwise there are a couple of other method one is the space charge limited current measurement that can be done at thinner film you just apply voltage and look at the uh, space charge regime where your uh, current is proportional to uh, v square and from that uh, there is a uh, modgarney relation you can uh, get the uh, Uh, mobility from there right and then there is another method uh, that's called sleeve charge extraction by linearly increasing voltage so that is slightly expensive method because you need sophisticated instrument to uh, sign a pulse light and then ramp the voltage so there there are three methods for uh, lat uh, so, uh, sorry uh, transverse mobility measurement 
apart from that if you want to measure mobility for fet uh, geometry like uh, thin film transistor geometry that can be also done from the ib uh, ids bds cloud right? there is the uh, probably the last question are this material different from oled okay uh, so normally organic leds you don't look for the uh, bulk heterojunction structure because you don't want the charge separation state so there you are looking at the charge recombination radiative recombination so in led materials what we uh, have is one active materials where or mc materials you can have and then uh, there are two charge transport layer which is which injects electrons and holes from the respective side and then at the active layer this electron and hole recombine and gives you light so uh, in that in that sense blend cannot be used for led because blend materials will have the charge separation and it will lose the radiative recombination uh, there so yes. okay and, uh, i think uh, another... dr sarkar has one more question she has one yeah. more query because this field lies uh, linearly with her uh, research work she works on the perovskite solar cell okay. so she will be okay perovskite probably i will be discussing in the next uh, presentation so maybe yeah i think this one you can if you can answer sometimes the intrinsic material provides large depletion width which enhances charge separation will it be helpful for yes so that's true that is that is what probably uh, i think sometimes like i do see the internet connection is yeah, unstable well, either is it from my side or somewhere uh, else i think now you are audible i'm using my land probably it should not um, you are audible now no problem no issue okay i'm audible right Yes, yeah. yes, so uh, the intrinsic materials provide large depletion width, which enhances charge separation. So uh, you have I mean, to keep in mind that the uh, charge separation is not only the uh, uh, one method to get the highest efficiency. Because at the same time, you have to look for how much the charge can diffuse. So that is probably another aspect. Like you can have well charge separation, but if if the charges are not able to drift or diffuse, diffuse means that is a uh, Uh, concentration gradient drift means because of the field right so if they are not able to diffuse to the respective electrode you will not be able to uh, get the charge extraction so that's what the perovskite becomes so essential because there the diffusion length charge carrier diffusion length is somewhere in micron so that that can travel a long distance unlike polymer so the diffusion length is quite low for uh, polymer like uh, 40 50 uh, nanometers for free charge carriers so it doesn't diffuse much so even if you increase the thickness definitely uh, device doesn't work right so maybe you so, will uh, discuss in the uh, other presentation so there is another question so i questions. think uh, i ha i had no uh, so far we don't have any question in the chat box uh, i think uh, uh, yeah she uh, was still uh, asking for the fabricating solar cell and what are you thinking about part of sky i think ma'am uh, okay yeah. so perovskite started... definitely i'll be discussing the challenges as a well, little bit of so that is what okay. my talk was related to, will be related to the uh, stability issues i mean i'll be talking about ion migration so but uh, i think uh, sneth has already proposed they will uh, launching the device soon by next year or maybe yes. by 2020 to yes, 2022 so that will be discussing okay so yeah, any other another questions? question we have should we have uh, to calculate the uh, reorganization okay. energy for both electron and the hole yes uh, normally uh, uh, the whole side we don't do that much because your hole is already there in the uh, acceptor materials right but the electron gets transferred from the donor to the acceptor that is what so if you use a ternary uh, blend solar cells where you have electron and hole both are traveling or uh, there is a uh, by way transport of electron and hole definitely you should look for the reorganization energy for both the device uh, both the materials phase yes true so i think uh, with the but for p3st uh, but... pc one normally people talk about only electron because hole is already there in uh, p3st phase okay, okay uh, thank you uh, if not any more questions i would like to thank you again for this opportunity yes. it was a uh, nice discussion with all of you all the participants yes, uh, and uh, thank you yeah. thank you dr bag thank you for your nice presentation and also you are generous enough to answer all the questions a uh, lot of questions from the Uh, attendees 
Yeah, and, it's my uh, pleasure. Thank, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you for answering all. And uh, I would be, I would have uh, one question from my side. I think we yes, have sure. a couple of only one or two minutes. I will take because yeah, no I have problem. the. Yes. I have the privilege of working with uh, on rather say on the organic photovoltaic materials that you begin with uh, of your lecture, uh, and uh, my eyes were glittered to see through fullerenes and the bisphosphine items you showed, which are of the donor and the acceptor materials. So uh, my query is, uh, how do you feel being a theoretical chemist? Um, the future of fuller fullerene containing photovoltaic materials uh, concerning the organic photovoltaic cell. Okay, to be frank, actually people are moving away from polarin based acceptors. Yeah, so That's for sure. Uh, so people are looking for more uh, polymer, polymer, uh, polymeric donor materials. And I guess the highest reported efficiency is not for uh, like uh, C60. I did not look for the, uh, the recent trend in uh, polymer, as you said, because I have moved to perovskites uh, uh, like 2014, like last six, seven years, so sort of like isolated from uh, polymer solar cell. But uh, from the literature, what I uh, feel is like a PCBM may not be very stable because when you expose it to UV light, actually PCBM also degrades. Exactly. And same as like exactly. P, uh, P PSS. I mean, you have to go away from the P dot PSS to make a uh, stable device. So there are a lot of oxides, materials, uh, uh, like copper oxides, nickel oxides, they're much more yeah. stable whole transporters. Or oxides, they're much more uh, stable whole transporter. Probably you have to look for the inorganic uh, whole and electron transporter, and away from the uh, fullerene based uh, uh, piecement. Because the problem of small molecule is they can diffuse, so their morphology is not uh, very stable. I mean, like even if like, after, that, like yes. yes, yes, after a few days also they start uh, migrating to the different phases. As I yeah. say, in that sense, like polymer and sometimes maybe like cross-link polymer would be better way to uh, basically what do you call the arrest this migration so that your yes. morphology doesn't change over a period yeah. of time you need to right. keep your morphology otherwise it doesn't make sense to make yes, that yes. material yes exactly. okay yeah. thank you very much and uh, as uh, dr madhumita dasharka said that you can be a very good or you are uh, indeed a very good collaborator in that case with macout and uh, iit Roorkee because we people work on this quite similar okay, kind of sure, thing. Definitely. So definitely. Maybe we can, in future, we can have the discussion for Absolutely. that. And uh, yes. on behalf of the organizing committee, I also thank you very much once again for taking your time and sharing your results and uh, uh, very wonderful and enthusiastic talks. And I think uh, the way we have interacted during the question answer session that uh, uh, replicates uh, or display the, I mean, the accessibility of your lecture. So thank you very much, okay. Dr. Bach. Thank you very okay, much. So we, will, we will also have you in the uh, next session when you come uh, in the FDP, you have another session. So okay. we have the opportunity to interact with you. So for this session, I think uh, this is, we have answered everything. And just for the participant, I want to see, uh, say that in the chat box, you have the feedback link uh, for this session. And uh, also you have the registration link. You can copy that. Uh, this is for tomorrow morning. So uh, only to say that thing, just uh, fill up the feedback form for this link, uh, with this link for this session. And uh, as uh, we did yesterday, because of the technical issues, we have to shift to another platform, the digital platform, which will be the Google Meet, uh, quite like yesterday, same way. And uh, you already have the link for that one in your uh, program schedule. So just get joined at uh, 3 p.m. accordingly, uh, what we did yesterday, the similar way. So I think this is from my end. I think Dr. Orijit Bag, if you want to say something, if you, if I missed. No, it's okay. Uh, no, we are uh, you know, close to 12 o'clock. So yes. we can finish yes. now. So yes. I think uh, you should conclude or uh, Malaysia should conclude this session. So I would like to thank all the panelists once again and all the attendees for taking your time um, for attending the session. Thank you very much. We will see you at uh, 3 p.m. today in the second session and uh, the panelists also. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.